Just watching. I don't care what anybody says. Meet the Robinsons is and always will be my favorite Disney film of all time. And in fact, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, period. So why not talk about how this thing got made? And trust me, it's a wild ride. A lot of the Disney fans know what happened, but the casual audience would look at this film and go, Yeah, isn't that one of those weird Disney films that tried to be Shrek, but it wasn't Shrek? Kind of like that movie about that little chicken, uh, what's it called again? Oh yeah, Beauty and the Beast. And then they wouldn't give it a second thought. But what if I told you that the production behind Meet the Robinsons is the good ending version of the production of The Black Cauldron? Oh yeah, that movie that had about 30% of its footage cut to avoid an R rating and almost destroy Disney animation? Yeah, that one. So let me walk you through the wild journey that is, the history of Meet the Robinsons. Meet the Robinsons started off as a book. A children's book, no less. A 29-page picture book known as A Day with Wilbur Robinson, where an unnamed boy with spiky blonde hair goes to visit his next-door neighbor, well... William Robinson. Here the two boys try to look for Grandpa Robinson's missing teeth, all while meeting the bizarre yet charming residents of the Robinson household, including a robot and a giant squid. A Day with Wilbur Robinson was written by William Joyce. He, along with his friend Bill Borden, wanted the book to be adapted into a feature-length film, so who better to create a world based around these crazy characters than the blockbuster magician himself, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg tried again and again and again to come up with a concept for the film, but he couldn't make it work. So eventually, the plans to adapt the book were ultimately scrapped. Until a Disney executive by the name of Leo Chu caught wind of this and he became a big fan. So big, in fact, that he had some of the writers at Disney come up with a concept script. They fleshed out the story a bit more, added time travel elements, and included a villain. In no time at all, the first script was completed, and apparently, it was really something special. A man by the name of Steven Anderson had just finished working as a story supervisor on Brother Bear. And now, he was ready to have his own project, but what was he gonna do? Well, upon reading the first page of A Day with Wilbur Robinson, he immediately knew what he wanted to do. Firstly, he found the world and concept that the film created to have a lot of potential for future development. And secondly, and most importantly, he identified with the main character. Much like Lewis, Anderson himself was adopted, and he asked the same questions that Lewis did when he was his age. Why did my parents give me up? Why haven't they come to seek me out now? Was I not good enough for them? And again, much like Lewis, as time went on and he became closer with his real family, Anderson realized that those questions didn't really matter. So what if he wasn't good enough for somebody else? He has a family here and now that loves him very much. Anderson immediately attached himself to the project, saying that he wouldn't consider anything else. And his first act as lead of the project was to write the script once again. See, the first script was good, but it still needed some fleshing out. One of the biggest issues that Anderson had with the first script was that it had no theme. In order to give the film a bit of a purpose, he wanted the writers to include a perseverance message. In other words, as the film would like to say, keep moving forward. Whether it be creating a grand invention, having some kind of misstep in your road to success, or trying to find a family, everybody deals with failure at least one point in their life and many tend to shut down and give up entirely, never achieving their full purpose. So here the film would be to help cheer people on and help them persevere through the tough times. And during Anderson's supervision of a new script, he wanted there to be as much of the original book included as possible. For the most part, he got his way. A few of the characters were cut and a couple of them were swapped, most notably Tallulah having the gimmick of Blanche, and it being Mrs. Robinson that conducts the Band of Frogs and not Grandpa Bud. But everything else, like the most colorful characters, the dinner scene, the hunt for the teeth, 
the overall bonding between Lewis and Wilbur, that all came from the book. When it was all said and done, the team was really happy with what they had. Maybe a little too happy. One of the animators, Mark Anthony Austin, said that this was the script that they should have gone with, not the final version. And while that may seem a little strange now, it'll make a little bit more sense when we get deeper in the story, trust me. Disney was willing to greenlight the film, but first, they had to make sure it would work. So what Disney had the team do was create an animatic for the film and screen it in front of the executives. Two other films were doing this. They were Nomeo and Juliet, not to be confused with the one that would be created later in 2011 or so, and an unproduced film called Friday Cat. Whichever film had the best reaction would be put into production. Wouldn't you know it, A Day with Wilbur Robinson won. Not just because it was the most enjoyable and the most commercially viable, but also because it was the only one to get the animatic actually completed. Yeah, finishing your work definitely has its rewards. And once Wilbur Robinson was put into production, things begin to change. The script went through numerous rewrites, adding in characters, taking them out, adding in scenes, taking them out, and developing a wackier tone as each draft progressed. With this wackier tone also came a greater focus on the family. Before now, they were a lot like they were in the book, being just a couple lines and a brief gimmick, and that was it. And while the family doesn't get a ton of individual screen time in the final product, it's certainly a lot more than what we would have had before. This was especially needed during the dinner scene, where it just felt like everybody was a bunch of talking heads with no personality. And with this greater attention on the personalities of the family, the film went from outlandish, to outlandish and silly, to off-the-walls Looney Tunes insanity. Speaking of Looney Tunes, that was the crew's main inspiration for how the characters would talk to each other, all the jokes that would fly by, and how wild the animation would be. But speaking of the animation, that's where the problems would start to arise. Things were fine during the production stage. William Joyce, who wrote the book, was more than happy to help design the characters, but there was a small problem called Blue Skies Robots. He did the designs for this film too, he might end up plagiarizing himself with doing the art for robots. So they changed the art style up a little bit, gave it some variation from the book, and Joyce helped make it its own thing. But then it was time to start testing out the animation. To put it simply, the Disney animators were not ready to make a fully 3D movie with only humans as the main characters. Oh sure, there's Lefty and Carl and Doris, but for the most part you're following characters like Lewis or Wilbur or Franny. And the only computer-animated films that Disney had made up until this point were Dinosaur and Chicken Little, neither of which featured a predominantly human cast, or humans at all. There were dozens of prototypes for the characters and the movements that were constantly altered or thrown out. The process heavily relied on trial and error. It was exhausting, but eventually they got it down. And once they did, the crew was able to add some subtle elements that would help give some extra depth to the story. One of the main things that Steven Anderson was most proud of was the symbolism of clouds. In the past, it's always a cloudy day. Even when it's sunny, there's still clouds in the sky. Lewis doesn't get past them until he goes to the future where it's constantly sunny all day. And then in the bad future, it's dark storm clouds and yeah, I think you get what I mean here. There were also other touches like making the bad future that Doris ran based on an old Texas mining town or having green be the bowler hat guy's main color and whenever he would get angry or full of emotion there would be a splash of green. Now that these issues were out of the way, the film was starting to change less and less. There were a couple small details being altered like Wilbur going from a wide-eyed curious kid to a loudmouth troublemaker, or Aunt Petunia turning into a puppet. She wasn't like this in the book, but one of the animators came up with an idea to add some extra insanity to the Robinsons' household by making one of the characters a puppet, drawing inspiration from a terrible ventriloquist act he saw while he was in Vegas. All the film would need now is a new title. A Day with Wilbur Robinson just didn't really roll off the tongue. After a whole bunch of demo ideas, they came up with the title of Meet the Robinsons, and the film was officially ready for its 2006 release. But then, something happened. Something that would change the animation industry Forever. Disney had officially bought Pixar Studios. 
This was a huge deal. While yes, Disney would distribute Pixar's films and get a cut of the revenue, Pixar was still effectively competition. And this was a point in time where Disney was at the bottom of the heap. Many of their recent films had been critical and or commercial failures, and they were willing to try anything to get themselves out of this rut. They needed a second Disney renaissance, and they needed it quickly. That's one of the reasons why Meet the Robinsons was allowed to be the way that it was. If it was strange and bizarre, fine. If it had a disjointed story in an abnormal setting, that's okay too. Clearly, the things that Disney had been trying up until this point just didn't work. So maybe the crew behind this film knew what to do. That was the attitude at first. But then things started to change once Disney officially owned Pixar. The first notable change was that some Pixar animators decided to help out with the project. They coached the animators on how to animate humans and make them look realistic, but also keep that lively edge to keep the audience entertained. It goes without saying that The Incredibles was a main source of inspiration. That change was all fine and good. What wasn't all fine and good, though, was how John Lasseter decided to change the story to be something... Now, I wouldn't say grander or better written, but to be more marketable. Again, Disney was scared for their financial future, so they needed a surefire hit. He ordered one change, and then another, and then another, and then another, and then eventually, anywhere from 30 to 60% of the final movie was scrapped. I'm not giving a solid number here because, honestly, nobody knows just how much of the film was cut. Even Anderson gives different numbers depending on when you talk to him. Mike Belzer, the animation supervisor for Meet the Robinsons, had this to say. A lot of thought has gone into why these characters are this way. Their character arcs, how they're responding to one another. It's a very complex puzzle that's being created. So, arbitrarily throwing something out is pretty disheartening. But when you have a high-ranking person tell you something, often, it has to be done. Sure enough, that's what happened. New scenes came and went faster than you could blink. One of these new scenes just so happened to be the fight with the T-Rex. But perhaps the most notable change came to the movie's villain. This man was named Ignatius Pink, then later changed to Mortimer Clench. He was the exact opposite of Mr. Robinson. While he too was an inventor, he was lazy and evil and wanted fame just for fame's sake. Making the world a better place was an afterthought, if it was a thought at all. So throughout the story, this man would steal Robinson's inventions and claim them as his own. And while he was a decent character, he needed a sharp glow up. The script described him wearing a bowler hat, but there was never any given reason. Until now. The bowler hat was alive, and little by little, she went from being his sidekick, to his equal partner, to the one secretly controlling the plan behind the scenes. And as the hat grew stronger, the villain, now named just Bowler Hat Guy, became sillier and weaker. And then one day in the writer's room, they were all thinking of ideas for where they could take the character, and someone blurted out, What if we made him Lewis's roommate? Mike Yagubian, the little six-year-old that constantly stayed awake every night because Lewis would just not stop inventing. Anderson was skeptical at first, but then when he saw how the audience reacted to the next test screening, he knew this is where they had to go. And with this new story idea in place, they were able to have parallel protagonists. If you ask Anderson, he would say that Bowler Hat Guy is the other main character of this movie, not Wilbur. And that's because Bowler Hat Guy, much like Lewis, has to learn the lesson of keep moving forward. While they're on opposing sides, they're on the same path, and they process their information and lessons in entirely different ways. This would not only add some more depth to the story, but it would also cover more angles for the lesson. The audience would be able to see a good ending and a bad ending, and then judge for themselves which one they would want to be like. The other change came with Carl. He didn't really do anything throughout most of the movie. There were some plans to make him pretend to be an uptight snob when he's around the family, and then just be a regular schmo when he's all alone. But that didn't really work. So instead, they decided to use him to fix one of the issues they had up until now. The fact that Wilbur didn't really have any friends outside of Lewis. He needed somebody to talk to, especially someone who was on his level. Conversations with Lewis could only get so far because, keep in mind, Lewis is the fish out of water. He has no idea what's going on here in the future. 
Luckily, Harlan Williams, who was cast to play the role of Carl, was able to use the skill of improv to make the character his own. His vocal mannerisms and his jokes, they were all Williams' own creation. Oh yeah, I guess I should probably talk about the cast now, right? Well, I've already talked about Harlan Williams and how he was able to make improv create a new character for Carl. But now let's talk about some of the others. Steven Anderson, yes, that Steven Anderson, the one we've been talking about for about 15 minutes now, played the part of Bowler Hat Guy. It's a similar story to how C. Martin Crocker got the role of Zorak in Space Ghost Coast to Coast. Sometimes when you do the animatic, that test voice from the scratch audio is just too perfect to get rid of, you know? Angela Bassett was cast by chance. There was a movie being played in the office and someone walked by it, heard her voice and thought, you know, she would make a pretty good Mildred. Adam West was cast as Uncle Art and he was told to play it entirely straight, knowing full well that Adam West's natural energy would bring the comedy all on its own. Laurie Metcalf, who played Lucille Crunklehorn slash Robinson, was very excited to play the young counterpart, but when it came to the grandma side, that got a little bit tricky. She would legitimately strangle herself during recording sessions to give it the proper tone. The crew felt bad for her, but you couldn't argue with the results. When Nicole Sullivan was cast as Franny, the crew knew that she could bring the humor, but they weren't so sure about the heart. But lo and behold, she blew them away. Guess they should have given her more credit, huh? But perhaps the most interesting story of the cast would be the two kids, Wilbur Robinson and Lewis slash Cornelius Robinson. Because the film took so long to make, those two kids ended up going through puberty, and with the new script being so different from the original, bringing those boys in for retakes was out of the question. So what were they gonna do? Well, for each of the kids, they came up with a different idea. For Lewis, they ended up recasting him entirely. Instead of Daniel Hansen, he was going to be played by Jordan Fry, who was also Mike TV in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And that's actually the film that got him the role. According to many insider reports, both of them ended up playing the part of Lewis in the end. Some takes were Fry, and some were Hanson. And while yes, sometimes Lewis's voice sounds a little bit off so you can go, yeah, that's definitely this boy and not that one, for the most part, it's really hard to tell. Also, funny story. The joke about Cornelius Robinson looking like Tom Selleck was in the movie way before anybody thought of actually casting Selleck as Robinson. The original joke was that Wilbur was picking the least likely person to be confused with Cornelius Robinson to throw Lewis off the trail. But then they got the idea of approaching Selleck himself, and after making it clear that they weren't making fun of him, he agreed. As for Wilbur, he was originally played by Wesley Singerman. And with him being recast, he was now being played by... Wesley Singerman again. What they had him do was redo the entire script, but this time with his new post-puberty voice. Except for this line, yeah, one of the pre-puberty lines ended up making its way in the final cut. What did he mean if he had a family? Oh, Lewis is an orphan. Orphan? The score was composed by Danny Elfman, and Rob Thomas created an original song for this movie, Little Wonders, all without seeing more than five minutes of footage he didn't really know much about Meet the Robinsons whatsoever. Even so, he managed to make a beloved song that the entire crew raved about. But who didn't make a song that the crew raved about were the Jonas Brothers. They made a song for the film, and while the crew liked it, they didn't feel that it was consistent with the story or the tone. So instead, it was just a cross-promotion thing that Disney decided to drum up for hype. As the movie was wrapping up production, Anderson caught wind of a very interesting quote from Walt Disney. Around here, however, we don't look backwards for very long. We keep moving forward, opening up new doors and doing new things, and curiosity keeps leading us down new paths. Anderson was stunned. This quote would be perfect to have at the end of the movie. There were already a lot of talks amongst the crew that Lewis was a lot like Walt Disney with constant failure after constant failure before eventually using what he learned to get things right. So naturally, it had to go in. And now, with the music firmly in place, the cast being, well, cast, and the animation having its finishing touches put on, Meet the Robinsons was officially complete. It was late, and the production probably caused some PTSD, but it was done. It was officially released on March 30th, 2007, and the results weren't 
great. The critics liked the voice cast, the animation, and the overall message, but they felt that the story was disjointed and didn't have a lot of flow, and that the humor was invasive and focused on quantity over quality. All of which I disagree with, but to each their own. Funny enough, the parts that got the most derision like the introduction to the family, the teeth hunt, the dinner scene, those were all taken from the book. Meet the Robinsons was also, unfortunately, a box office bomb, gaining $169.3 million against a $150 million budget. Needless to say, this was not the hit that Disney was hoping for, but it did teach them a valuable lesson. Well, two actually. First was how to make a 3D animated film with a human cast. And the second one was to keep moving forward. The company and the crew and the cast, they were all very happy with the final cut. Sure, some people on the team wanted certain scenes to be in and not others, and to this day they still debate on which version of the script was the best, but they were still very happy with what they made. Even if it didn't turn a profit, it showed that Disney could still make some very strong animated features, especially with this new budding technology. Things looked dire after the release of Home on the Range, and while Chicken Little turned somewhat of a profit, people were not too kind to that thing when it came out. I mean, look at this score, yikes. Meet the Robinsons was a sign of things to come. If they kept down this road, they could end up making the next powerhouse in animation. And wouldn't you know it, just three years later, they got it. Tangled ended up taking the world by storm. Pre-Frozen days, of course. But this had a lot of the same elements as Meet the Robinsons. Wild and expressive characters in a 3D environment, a predominantly human cast, equal parts humor and heart, and maybe it's my personal bias because, again, I love this film to pieces, but it seems like Meet the Robinsons walked and tripped so that Tangled could run. Who knows where Disney would be today if it wasn't for Meet the Robinsons. If you're out there and you haven't seen it for quite a while, I highly recommend you check it out. And let me tell you, this won't be the only Meet the Robinsons video we have on this channel, and I'm not including the Bowler Hat Guy video that we made previously. Trust me, there's more to come. But enough thinking about the future for right now. It's time to wrap up the past. Whether you were a member of the crew who was going through these constant changes being forced by the studio, or if you were the studio themselves wondering if they could even continue with animated movies, just remember that Meet the Robinsons is proof that you can achieve whatever you want if you keep moving forward. Well, folks, thanks for watching the video. What'd you guys think? What was the most interesting part about the history of this movie? And who's your favorite character? My personal favorite is Bowler Hat Guy, with Bud being a close second. And I guess Gaston is a close third. I know he doesn't do a whole lot in the movie, but for one, he's got a good design, and his quirky character traits just really help him stand out, you know? Anyways, enough about me. Comment below and let me know because I'm always excited to hear what you guys have to say. And now it's time to thank our wonderful Patreon people, starting with our Masters of Fate, Chan11, Kev Messick, Manny Paredes, MD the Dude, Ryan Williams, Timey, and Woody Woo. And now our executive producers, Aaron Vasquez, Albert Robinson, Blackjack, Edward Haas, HR Hoffman, I am Vove, Indiscreet One, Ravioli Supremo, Unkale, and who else but Zane? If you too would like your name read at the end of every Media Mementos video, then why not donate to the Patreon? There's a link in the description below for you to check out. And there's also a link to the Media Mementos Discord server, so why not pop in and say hi? Alright friends, thanks for watching the video and I'll see you guys next time!